G'day everyone, I am the man called Kim Osabi, the man with the plan from the land down under, and I'm creating a comic. The company men, Dead White and Blue, is a 60-page full-color comic about a CIA-run metahuman strike force burned by their own agency while operating in the Middle East, and they fight to clear their name and stop an imminent terrorist attack. This comic is the first issue of an exciting, action-packed new IP that mixes the action of Suicide Squad with the intrigue of Homeland, Body of Lies, and Copra. With art by some of the best indie talent in South America, and a script by me, this comic promises to be the breakout hit of 2021. The sign-up page link for the campaign is in the description below. Backers who sign up go in the running for the chance to win original art pages from the comic itself. I hope you'll be motivated to join me on this journey, to trust me with a portion of your time, your money, and in return, I'll make the best comic book I can, in the hope it entertains you in a way modern comics so often fail to do. G'day everyone, I am the man called Kim Osabi, the man with the plan from the land down under, and I wanted to do a video on this tweet I saw yesterday. Mark Danvers tweeted out this image, titled, The Netflix Effect, referring to the impact the movie The Queen's Gambit has had on worldwide interest in chess. It says, since the movie debuted on October 23rd, 62 million households have watched the show, inquiries for chess sets are up 250% just on eBay, Google search queries for how to play chess has hit an all-time high in nine years, the original novel, The Queen's Gambit, is now a New York Times bestseller 37 years after its release. And the number of chess players on chess.com has increased by a factor of five. I think this is a fairly common occurrence. We all have interests and hobbies that receive a surge of interest and normies to the scene if that hobby gets featured in some way, particularly in television or movies. I'm dreading the day somebody makes a movie about <laughs> Look what happened to D&D when it was featured on Stranger Things. That show brought the 40-year-old game into the public consciousness like never before. Yes, it came on the tail end of a gradual increase in interest in the hobby, but the reissuing and repackaging of classic sets, miniatures and rule books was kicked off by interest generated by the show. To the detriment of the hobby in my opinion, but that'd be a topic for another video. Mark's point that he tweeted out was that if you were to search for a volume 1 of Spider-Man or Captain Marvel, there'd be dozens to choose from. He doesn't specify, but I think he's talking about first issues. There are a dozen different first issues of Ms. Mar I mean Captain Marvel, I mean Carol Danvers. Marvel in particular has a bad habit of rebooting the comics with a new number one whenever a writer leaves the title or when sales are flagging too low. This phenomenon makes comics opaque and accessible in a way that chess is not. And I believe this is the point Mark was making. You want to play chess? You buy a chess set. Most gift shops have them. Or, or you order one online. You learn the rules from YouTube videos and find someone to play against. Even easier, jump on this chess.com and learn the hard way. Many computers even come shipped with some version of chess installed where you can grab a free version of the game from the Play Store. Chess is imminently accessible. The rules aren't even that numerous or complex. Most popular board games would have more rules than chess. The rulebook for chess would be a lot smaller than the rulebook for Monopoly. This tweet got me thinking about the problem of comic books being inaccessible and the different types of inaccessibility and how these problems came about in the formerly multi-billion dollar industry. Mark correctly identifies that comics are inaccessible because of the constant reboots. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that these reboots are coming so fast and thick Sometimes the character is rebooted more than once within the same year. This is an immediate impediment. Some people will just stop there. There are online lists and articles, bibliographies and Wikipedia that will list titles in chronological order and reading order. People want things to be easy. They want them to be accessible. If they see 10 number one issues, no easy way to discern which is real, which takes priority and what order to read them in, they'll just nope out of there and go play COD or something. Chess doesn't have continuity. Chess doesn't have a high bar for entry. If somebody wants to get into Captain Marvel as a character, they have a 40-year history, multiple miniseries, reboots, team appearances, costume changes, and even name changes to contend with. To the comic book fan, this is Ambrosia. We love to deep dive into a character's history and learn all the odd storylines, forgotten family members, powers, and feats that aren't listed on Wikipedia. The normies don't want this. Not really. If they did, they'd probably be comic fans already. Add to the mess of 40-plus years of rigid continuity, the recent development in Marvel, particularly, of non-continuity writing... A year or two ago, Marvel announced that all stories published by them were essentially non-continuity. They all matter and none of them matter. This all happened and none of them happened. This is interesting because it seems to be the way that the DC Cinematic Universe is being run, but it's contrary to the very tight continuity of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've never seen such a contrary industry. These publishers, particularly the big two, and of them particularly Marvel, constantly say one thing and do another. They set up an expectation and fail to meet it, or straight up contradict it and by doing so, cost themselves money. Continuity is lifeblood to comics, and comic fans alike. Ignoring it is ignoring the fans. You expect a new fan to wade through 40 years of history to be then told none of it matters except when it does, but then it might not in the next arc? Confused, right at the height of the MCU's popularity, new fans might go to a comic shop and ask for guidance. They'd maybe be handed an issue of the Avengers to coincide with the first movie. 
In it, they'd find Thor was now a woman, Captain America was an imprisoned Nazi, Hulk was dead and replaced by his cousin, Iron Man was a disembodied AI guiding a sociopath wearing his stolen tech, and Black Widow was Black Widow. Straight white women aren't the tent poles of the industry. She's fine to stay how she is, right, Gail? There is no chess industry. No one is making billions of dollars a year off chess. There is virtually no barrier to play chess. If you had to, you could make a chess board from paper and a pencil, or draw a board in the dirt and use marked pebbles. So long as you knew the rules, you could play. Comics have created several significant barriers to entry, but paradoxically, these barriers are the very things die-hard fans love. These barriers acted as gates to keep out those people who weren't committed or willing to put in the time to learn and become part of the scene. At a time when those barriers were at their lowest, when the MCU and Funko Pops and mainstream video games are all pushing these characters, the industry did a huge about-face and killed off their most recognisable icons to push a gender and ideology, and replace them with a cast that is as forgettable as they were diverse. Mainstream American superhero comic book industry is dying, and the one chance to save it was ignored for virtue signalling, for the empty silent accolades of all the SJWs and hipsters that don't actually read comics. The Netflix effect made chess more popular than it's been for decades. The Netflix effect on the popularity of chess was a fluke. Nobody set out to make a chess movie for the purposes of making chess more popular. It just happened. A $10 billion plus box office take over more than a dozen movies couldn't help Captain Marvel sell more than 20,000 copies a month. The biggest publisher in comics, boosted by Disney money, couldn't capitalise on the most profitable trend in 21st century cinema. If that doesn't convince you the people helming the HMS comic book either don't know what they are doing or don't care, then you don't want to be convinced.